Amen. How are you? I think I already asked you that once today, didn't I? It's kind of my go-to thing, I guess. Um, so, we're starting a new series, the Lie Detector series, and um, one of the things that I thought a lot about over the last few months on sabbatical was this particular issue of the the lies that are present and pervasive in our culture um, that the enemy has done a, a really good job at convincing people of things that just are not true. And how do we as Christians deal with that? Do we know, do we understand uh, what the Word of God says, what God reveals versus what we're hearing in our culture, and, and how well do we navigate that, basically. And, and here's the thing that I, I, I thought. If you know the truth, it's easy to detect a lie. You think about that for a second. If you know the truth, it's easy to detect a lie. So let me just give you a, an example, and this is a hypothetical, okay, so just so you know, it's not an actual event because it will call into question somebody's character, but just a hypothetical. Let's say that I went to Walmart and uh, I'm in the parking lot, I'm getting ready to leave, and uh, all of a sudden uh, I see Molly pull into a parking spot and walk in, and, and so I sit there and I wait for a minute and hear one she comes out, a couple bags, and, and leaves, and she never sees me sitting there, okay? So I go back to work, whatever, and then later on in the day, I come home, and I say, so what you been doing today? Which is, I don't know, how many of you do that? Whenever you see your spouse, you're like, what you been doing today? And uh, usually it's not an interrogation, okay? <laughs> Just so you know, <laughs> wives, it's not, okay. But she says, I've been home all day. I haven't left the house. And I say, hmm, interesting. You sure about that? And she says, absolutely. I never left the house. I've been here all day. So here's the thing. Now, this did not happen. Okay, this is not a real event. So, uh, but it's easy for me to know that that's not true. Right? Because I saw her. I saw the vehicle. I saw her. I saw her go in. I saw her come out. I saw the whole thing. Like, I witnessed that with my eyes. I, it's not in question that this is the truth. So when she says something else that is a lie, it's not hard for me to know that it's a lie. In fact, it's actually impossible for me to deny what I know to be true. I know that this is true. I know that what you're saying is not true because I've seen it with my eyes. I know for a fact that you left the house, you went to Walmart, you did this or whatever. We're not getting into the reasons why that, you know, somebody might lie. I'm just saying that when you know the truth, then lies are easy to detect. In fact, they're not just easy to detect. They're impossible not to detect if you know the truth. And so when the church is having an issue, a problem with understanding the things of our culture that are, to some, obvious lies. They're clearly not true. They're clearly not the reality. They're clearly not what God says. Why do we struggle to see that and, and not just detect it, but to, to almost impossibly not be able to detect it? Like, that was a weird sentence. Okay, we, we like we... We should be so clear about what the truth is that that's, we couldn't possibly deny that that's a lie, and yet we struggle. And, and part of the reason why I think we struggle, and, and no, I'm not trying to be a big downer, okay, but there's a lot of biblical illiteracy in the church of America today. People don't know what the Bible says. They don't know what it says. They don't read it. They don't know what it means. Uh, I think a lot of people are waiting for a sermon to hear what the Bible says. And I'm going to tell you, um, you, 
and I've said this so many times, I'm a broken record, I know, the sermon should compel you to go read your, your Bible for yourself. Confirm what I or any other preacher is saying with your own study, your own reading, your own due diligence, asking the Holy Spirit to give you an insight into the truth, and the Holy Spirit will resonate with you whether or not what is being said from the pulpit is true or not, and if it's not, then maybe it's well-meaning and just misguided, and you need to say, hey, pastor, you said this, and that's not right. And hopefully, you know, a wise person will, will accept correction as a gift. But if they're persistent in saying, I'm going to teach this even though I know that you're, what you're saying may be true, then guess what? You need to go find another church that actually preaches the word. Okay? So what we have to do, though, is understand what is the truth. What is the truth? And so let's, let's take a look at what Scripture says about this issue uh, we're in John chapter 18. We're going to pick it up in verse 33. John 18, starting in verse 33 through 38. Standing as we read God's word this morning, we do that out of respect for God and to wake you up a little bit. <laughs> Pilate entered the headquarters again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation, chief priests, have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. And Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for the power uh, of your spirit to take the truth of your word, plant it into our hearts, and give us uh, a relationship, or help us to have a relationship with you through the blood of Jesus. Lord, it's an amazing gift, and I praise you for that. I thank you for all that you are able, all that you want to do in us, revealing truth, revealing yourself, revealing your will, helping us to have the ability to live a life worthy of that calling, and then using that somehow mysteriously to be a witness, testimony to the world around us, Lord, that is so dark, misguided, misunderstanding. Um, but Lord, I'm praying and I believe there's hope that, that people want to know the truth. Maybe they struggle to discern it. Maybe they struggle to understand it. Maybe they struggle to see it clearly, but I'm praying, Lord, that the world has a, a hope or a desire to know you and help us to reveal you through our lives, through our witness, through all that we do in our worship. Lord, we pray that you'd be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Pilate says something interesting, ominous, weird in a way. He says, what is truth? And then he doesn't listen to the answer. <laughs> okay, so he says, what is truth? And, you know, we take that, that phrase, that, that statement that he, he, uh, he uses, and, and we think, man, for 2,000 years, the world still has not figured this out. Okay, we, we have this person seems to be kind of lost in what he thinks the truth is or what he thinks should happen, what he thinks, you know, what the reality of Jesus is and all the rest of it. And then here we are 2,000 years later and the world is still struggling. In fact, you know, we, there's a poll um, that was taken to try to understand what do people think about truth, absolute truth. And what uh, was discovered was that 60%, which is 
shockingly low, 60% said they believe there is such a thing as absolute truth, which means 40% say they don't believe in absolute truth. That's kind of weird that they, that 40% of Americans would say, I, I don't know that there's absolute truth. And then you go a little bit deeper into the survey and you find out that 30-year-olds and younger were more inclined to believe that there is no such thing as absolute truth. 55% of 30-year-olds and younger said they didn't think there was absolute truth. 45% said that there was. So we're kind of at a weird tipping point where the young generation coming up, the majority of them, okay, we're not talking about a small number. We're talking about the majority of young people 50 or 30 years and younger are saying, I don't know that there is such a thing as absolute truth. Now, do you find that strange? Or do we not really know what we're talking about when we say absolute truth? So I was uh, talking to somebody the other day. I said, hey, what, do you, what are you preaching on? You know, I get that question all the time. What are you preaching on this week? And I'm like, well, I don't know yet. I'll find out. No, I'm... <laughs> Sunday morning, I, no. Um, I said, uh, I'm preaching on the truth, which, I mean, I should hopefully be able to say that every week, right? Uh, no matter what I'm doing, I'm preaching the tr- on the truth. But the immediate response, and I thought this was interesting because this was a, a believer, this was a, a committed Christian person. They said, wow, that's a moving target, isn't it? Hmm. What does that mean? What? Why, why would we say that? Why would, why would a Christian person say the truth is a moving target? You know, curious? So I thought, let's just test our congregation. Let's see if we can discern some absolute truth. What is, this will blow your mind, two plus two? Anybody? Okay. Now, is it four because you want it to be four? Because emotionally, you're attached to the number four. Like, that's, that's your opinion. But my opinion could be different. Do you think that perhaps that two plus two always equals four? Or is it a cultural thing? Are we, are we Americans so arrogant to think that we've determined that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but over in India they say that 2 plus 2 equals 3 and a half? Like it, it's just a cult, like you're just, you've been indoctrinated into thinking that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but eh, other cultures take it differently. Is that the case? Or is it always four, no matter where you go, who you talk to, whose opinion, how they feel about it? It's always four, right? Can we agree to that? Yeah. Would that be absolutely true? Yeah. Is, see, if the thing is, like with math, I don't love math, but I don't get to determine the answers. Because if I did, man, it would work a lot differently. Like, whenever I made a purchase money would go into my bank account. <laughs> Instead of a subtraction, it would be a plus sign. No, X, it would be times. Right? Why not? If I get to choose truth and I can determine wh- how I feel about it, then I would say math is going to work a lot differently than how it seems to work. But that's not how it works. Because it's absolutely, this is how it, how it is. This is the truth. Um, let me give you another example, as if you needed one. Guess which direction my keys are going to fall when I drop them. How many say down? Anybody think they're going to go up? Sideways? Float in the air? Okay, let's test it. Down. I wonder why that would be. It's kind of crazy. 
If I did that 10 times, do you think that nine times they'd fall down and one time they might float up? Why is that? Gravity. This is what we call a law, physical law, right? It, and it always works that way. Not nine times out of 10, not 99 times out of 100, but a 100 times out of 100, every single time, gravity works that way because it's a, a law. It's how things are. Isaac Newton figured out the mathematics behind gravitational pull. But they always knew that things fell down. They just didn't quite understand all the math behind it, right? It, this is how things are. It's the way that, that things function. So what we're talking about in some ways is absolute truth, but we're talking about reality. Truth equals reality. So here's what we got to get back to, okay? Spiritual truth is, well, this is a dangerous question. Is spiritual truth absolute or is it subjective? You don't want to answer that because we want it to be subjective. I want my spiritual truth to be for me but not for you. Or I want it to be for you and not for me. But spiritual truth is like any other absolute truth. It is true all across the board. Why is that? Jesus uh, says that he is the truth. And when he says to Pilate, he says, I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. He said, way back in John 1, we see that the word of God was, the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is Jesus. And it says that that word was full of grace and truth. And so we have there what we call the incarnation. Okay, the incarnation is just a fancy word for embodiment. Jesus embodies the fullness of God, okay? He is God in the flesh. Not only does he embody the word of God, he embodies the truth of God, okay? He, he is full of grace and truth, the fullness of God, the fullness of truth. He is the truth. So if you say, well, I don't know, that doesn't exactly say he is the truth, but there is a passage that does say that he is the truth. Remember John 14, 6, Jesus says, what? I am the way, the truth, in the life, no one comes to the Father except by me. What arrogance. No one comes to the Father except through him? How can he possibly say that? Because it's true. Because he is God. When, when Jesus says, he, or when the Bible says he is full of truth, that he is, that when people listen to him, they hear the truth. It's not just that he says true things, not just that he speaks reality or concepts that are true or he will never lie. What he's saying is that he is the embodiment of God. He is the embodiment, the revelation of who God is. So Colossians says it this way, says he is the image of the invisible God. And then it says over in Colossians 2, so that was Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Chapter 2, verse 9, it says it this way, For in him, Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. It's another way to say he's the incarnation of God. The whole fullness of deity, God, dwells in him bodily. Hebrews says it a little bit differently. I love how Hebrews uh, declares it in chapter 1, verse 3. It says, He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. You just go on and on and just you feel empowered by these statements about who Jesus is. But here's what we understand, that when the Bible declares Jesus is the word of God, he's the truth of God, and he is the embodiment of God, that he is God, this is why he is the truth. Because there's only two things that can be true. One or the other has to be true. Either there's a God who created the universe. Okay? That's one possibility. Or the universe is eternal by itself. 
That's a possibility. There are no other possibilities. You know how I know that? Because something exists. You, you exist, I exist, we exist in this reality. There is, there is an existence. And for there to be an existence, this is, I know, deeply philosophical, but it's absolutely true. For there to be anything in existence, something must exist eternally. It has to. If there was ever a point where there was nothing, then there would never be anything. Do we wrap our minds around that? Is that? It's not really that hard, is it? If something exists, then something has to exist eternally. It's why the question when people say, well, God created the universe, well, who created God is a really stupid question. I'm sorry. I've, if you've ever asked that, I'm not trying to offend you. But the, the truth is, the fact that something exists means something has to exist eternally. And the way that science, and I'm really science, this is not science, this is, this is religion. The way that science has said that, that this could possibly be is that there was a big bang where everything exploded and somehow a chaotic event created all this order. That's great. How, how do you get there, though? Because it just didn't pop out of nowhere. So they say, well, there was this point of singularity where everything for all eternity was in absolute equilibrium from eternity past in this pinpoint of, of energy and matter. And then, boom, it just exploded into the universe that we have now, which breaks every physical law that we know of. Because in order for something that is in absolute equilibrium to change, then it must be in, some force must act upon it. Well, what force would have acted upon it if it's the only thing that exists and it's in absolute equilibrium? Any scientists in the room want to explain that to me, please? Later? <laughs> it doesn't follow. But that's how they get around it. The universe existed eternally. Okay? And then here's what modern-day scientific religion would say. There's no God. The universe is acting all by itself, creating all this order, creating all this life, creating all this, these designs, these intricate things that can't possibly exist without somebody... I mean, just you look at some of the things that are evident in DNA, all the information. They say that if you could make a book out of one cell in your body of the DNA, the information in your, in your body, it would make a stack of books to the moon and back like 500 times. There's so much information just in one cell of your body, and it's imprinted on every cell, a blueprint for who you are as a human being. That's just one little thing, one person in the world, not talking about all the rest of creation and everything else that exists in the universe, macro and micro. Is this boring? Okay. Because I get kind of caught up in this stuff a little bit. But here's the deal. Existence proves eternality. Existence proves eternality. So when God says, I created, I made, I designed, I made you in my image, and all these different things, what he's saying is, God is, in his nature, he is ultimate reality because he is ultimate existence. He is the source of everything that exists. He holds it together. Jesus holds it together by the word of his power. If he stopped speaking the word of his power into the universe, it would cease to exist, just disappear. So truth is reality. Reality is God. You follow that? So what do you do with, with that? Here's what you understand. As a believer... 
in the, the creator, what I understand is that life is a shadow of the ultimate reality that we're heading towards in eternity. And, and it's kind of like your memories. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, my memories are not super vivid. I mean, there are some that, yes, are, are fairly vivid. But if I say, you know, how well do I remember this morning? It's kind of like, yeah, I got up, I did this, I don't, you know, it's like I don't have every little thing detailed in my mind. Anybody remember that, that what you ate this morning for breakfast? Anybody forget? Or yesterday? How about seven and a half years ago? You remember what you ate for breakfast? I mean, you just don't have every memory in, in vivid detail for your whole life. It's like a shadow of the things that are past. And right now is, is the clear moment of reality. But it, this afternoon, it's going to be like this foggy little thing. They say that you're only going to remember like 10% of what you heard this morning in church by like the time you go to bed tonight. And you're like, yeah, I forgot most of it already. <laughs> right? And, but ultimate reality is where we're headed, where we are going to be in the presence of God in such a way that it's going to be more real than this life. We think this life is real, and, and it is real, but it's not ultimate reality. Where we're headed is ultimate reality. And all of our life is going to look like this foggy thing we went through. It really will. And, and guess what? All the pain, all the hardship, all the question, the difficulties, the good things, whatever we go through, all these things, we're going to look back on that like it was just whew, a blink. Now, if you're an older person, doesn't your life seem like it's just been a blink? Like, man, I'm already X amount of years old. <laughs> I'm starting to like look at 50, like right around the corner. I mean, it's a few years away, but it's like 50. How could I be getting that old? Some of you are the, like 70. You're like, shut up. <laughs> but you're like, your life. It's my life. I mean, I, I could live to 100, I guess, but it's probably more than half over. It's just like going by so fast. And we go to heaven and whew, it's reality. This is truth. This is the truth of who God is. He exists eternally. And so when he reveals in his word who he is, this is the revelation. This is why we have faith in him because he is revealing what is absolutely, ultimately true about existence, relationship with him, eternity, because your life on this earth is going to end. It's going to end. Why are we putting so much effort in trying to convince ourselves there is no God when everything around us points to the reality that there is a God? It's like, because we, we don't want the next thing, which is moral truth. I think that's probably the big issue. When Pilate says what is truth, he may be struggling with this issue of what is right. What is right here in this situation? What's the moral truth? So I go back to that um, survey and I think people cannot be struggling with the idea of absolute truth in the sense of like two plus two equals four. Like they can't be thinking, well, I'm not sure. Maybe it equals six. Maybe in your opinion, my, what, they can't be struggling with that. I think they're misinterpreting the question or they've interpreted the question to mean they don't know if there's absolute moral truth because that's what people prefer, that morality be really subjective, it be personal, it be ambiguous, it be you know, based on how I feel, what I want in the moment, what's most expedient for me. And, and it, well, I'll do what I think is right. You do what you think is right. But I'm not going to try to argue with you about what's ultimately right. Right? Is that kind of where our culture seems to be right now? Is this idea like there's really no 
real certain, you know, the moving target of truth. Maybe it's the moral thing that we're struggling to find, you know, in this whole scenario. I don't, maybe. But here's what Pilate was dealing with was... Jesus, well, how do I want to say this? He didn't care what was right or wrong. He didn't care if it was right or wrong to kill Jesus, if Jesus was innocent or guilty. It didn't matter to him. That was not his problem. He didn't care about it. He killed people left and right. Pilate was brutal. He was vicious. He, he executed people constantly, crucified people. I mean, he had three that day. That was probably a slow day for Pilate, okay? He, he executed people by crucifixion all the time. This is unique, though, because Jesus, he is a public figure. People know him. They know who he is. He has followers by the thousands, right? I mean, just a week before this, Jesus was parading through the streets with thousands of people saying, Hosanna, praise him, you know, the, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the son of David, and all these things. Like, he went into the temple. He cleared it out. He made whips, and he whipped people. <laughs> Jesus, gentle and mild. <laughs> and they didn't touch him because they were afraid that if they arrested him, that they would have an insurrection on their hands, a riot. Pilate's not thinking, gee, I wonder if it's morally right to execute Jesus. What he's thinking is, will I get in trouble if I do this? Will, will my job be on the line? So he asked the questions about whether or not Jesus is the king, because he's trying to determine... Do you pose a threat to Caesar? And if so, do you pose a threat to me? And Jesus actually gives him a way out. He says, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. And so Pilate says, aha, your followers are not going to fight to defend you. So he can execute Jesus if he wants he can let him go, but he's got to deal with the religious rulers and what they're trying to do and whether or not they're going to cause an uh, insurrection or riot or some kind of problem for him. But his moral issue, his moral problem is, what's best for me? Listen, when we're talking about moral truth, here's where most of our country is struggling and, and a lot of the world is struggling. It's not about an absolute right or wrong. It's about what is best for me. What do I want? And here's the deal. This is why a lot of people say they don't believe in absolute truth. They don't want to believe that there's a God because they don't want to be subject to God's rules. I want to do what I want to do. And if I believe in God, logically... You say, he is the ruler. He's the judge. He's the judge of my, my soul. He's the judge of my life. He, I'm accountable to him. Somehow, in, in this twisted world that we live in, people have decided they're going to go ahead and believe in God, but they're not accountable to God. They're going to believe that God... So 80% of people say they believe in a God, but uh, that there's no moral truth. Well, what we have done is we have created a God in our own image. This isn't the God of the Bible. It's not the God that's revealed. This is the God that we want to exist. A God that only blesses and doesn't judge. A God that has no moral compass, no right or wrong. You do whatever you want, whatever you desire, and you just get to go to heaven because all we want is a God in heaven who who is very permissive, loving, accepting, and nothing else. He's not holy. He's not just. He's not righteous. And ultimately, if those things are true, then he's not even good. 
Because evil doesn't get punished. Sin doesn't get corrected. Atrocities, injustices never get dealt with. And uh, guess what? That's not a good God. So Pilate's question, what is truth, it really comes down to what is truth compared to power? Truth doesn't matter to me. What matters is power, authority, ability, the things that I can do. That's what matters more than truth. So here's what's funny is that in that sense, Pilate thinks that he's in control. He actually says this to Jesus. He says, uh, I have the power to kill you or to set you free. Because he's wondering why Jesus won't defend himself. And so here's the, the funny thing is that this is where most people think that they exist. I have the power to decide. I'm in control of my life. And I want to be in control of my life, right? The, the biggest hurdle for a lot of people from non-belief to faith in Christ is the issue of control. I can't get over it. You mean I have to submit myself to God? I have to yield to his will? I have to ex accept Jesus as my Savior? I have to seek his desire for my life? I have to not do what I want to do and, and seek to do what he wants me to do. I have to refrain from the things I like in order to do what he thinks is right. And a lot of people come to that hurdle. They're not necessarily saying, I don't believe in God. They're saying, I don't want to believe in a God that I have to submit to. And here's the deal, is that Pilate thought that he was in control, but he wasn't in control. Was he? He says, I find no guilt in him. In fact, if you look it up, you'll see that three different times he says, uh, he, he exonerates Jesus. He says he's innocent three times. And yet he still puts him to death. Why? Because he's not really in control. God is in control. God has determined from eternity past that he would provide a sacrifice to pay for the sin of the world and his son Jesus. This is the way, the only way. It is ultimate reality in that Jesus is going to go to the cross and he is going to pay for the sin of the world and anyone who looks to him in faith is going to be saved. That was what God had determined. That was God's plan. That was God's truth. And Pilate was, he had, he had very little to do with that. He just happened to be in that place at that time. But this is God's plan and no one and nothing is going to stop it. Jesus is going to die for the sin of the world, and those who believe in him will be saved. It's amazing to think that Jesus would be willing to do that for you and me. <laughs> I mean, what, what is truth? The truth is, God is holy, I'm a sinner. And the truth is this, Jesus bridges that gap. And he says, I will provide what you need. You can't do it for yourself, but I'll do it for you if you'll trust in me. So his words are this, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. All I know is that there are a lot of people who can hear a sermon and in their mind, the entire time, no matter what is said, say, I don't agree with that. I don't like that. I don't agree with that. I don't want that. I'm not into that. I'm not responsive to that. I don't care what you say. There's nothing you can say that can convince me. And, there, and listen, I know it. I, there's nothing that I can possibly say that will convince anybody because you have to open your heart to hear the word of Christ, to want the truth. And what I hope and what I believe is that the Holy Spirit can take a hard heart and crack just even a, a little hole in that hard heart and begin to funnel some truth in there so that even somehow against your better judgment or will or something that 
you begin to start to feel the stirring of the Holy Spirit say, uh, you know, I don't know about Luke, okay? Most people don't, but something about Jesus is getting to me. He is offering you life. He is inviting you to receive him as Lord. You can trust him. You're going to give control over your, of your life over to him as a scary thing. He will do a much better job with it than you ever would. But you got to give it up. It's the truth. Father, we thank you that you love us that much, willing to do naturally and supernaturally what we couldn't possibly achieve, Lord. Naturally, you sent your son to die on the cross. Supernaturally, it paid the price for sin for all time for everyone who would believe. And we thank you for that. We can't earn it. We can't pay for it. We can't bargain with it. Lord, we just have to receive it. And I pray that this morning you would clearly shine a light on the truth that you would open people's hearts and minds and eyes to it. Help us to be excited about you and about your truth, your word, what you've revealed and desire to walk closely with you, Lord. Thank you that your grace is so powerful that it can cleanse any sin, mistake, misstep, problem. Lord, you, you are able to do that. And we accept that, Lord, by faith. We thank you for it with a grateful heart. And we lift up your name today in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you this morning, as we always do, but the invitation is really for those who are yet to receive, yet to believe, for whatever reason, and if it's that control thing, some of that maybe is a pride that is just keeping you bound and coming to the altar could be a really important step for you to humble yourself and say yes to the Lord, that it can be kind of scary to say, I'm going to go to the altar, I'm going to kneel, and I'm going to receive what God has been speaking to my heart about. And if that's the case this morning, the prayer team is here. They would love to pray with you. Somebody would probably come by, and they'll probably lay their hand on your shoulder and, and say a prayer silently on your behalf. And if you want to just talk more, know more, pray more, um, they'd love to wait for you after the service and talk to you some more about whatever God's doing in your life. Amen? Let's stand and sing.